Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to be involved and to speak here today, and I, I welcome everyone myself. Uh, I have a bit of time, so I'll just tell a little story, but I remember, I think it was about 1998, we had a meeting through ILSI in April in Washington to discuss severe skin reactions. And there were people there from NIH, FDA, pharmaceutical industry, academia. It was not a large group, but a bunch of them. There were eight inches of snow that day. I remember that. And uh, it was beautiful and quiet and scary as anything. So uh, it was a memorable day. But after everybody went around the table explaining how important it was to be able to better understand, prevent, and manage severe skin reactions, I said, and I was a young man, so I said, maybe naively, but I don't think so. I have one question. Who's going to pay for it? And the FDA said, well, we can't pay for it. I said, well, can you leverage industry? Well, I don't think so. Industry said, well, it's not on a critical path, so we're not going to pay for it. NIH said, well, it could be translational, but I don't think we're going to pay for it. So I basically said, why don't we just go home? Because as much as we want to talk about this, everybody thinks it's someone else's problem. And I don't know, but in kindergarten or grade one or first grade, as you might call it, um, there was a story about the chicken who tried to uh, you know, harvest, plant the seeds, harvest the wheat, make the bread. Nobody was willing to help until the bread was made, then everybody wanted to eat some. That story always stuck with me. I was just surprised to come to an international meeting at that time and see it still held true. So let's see, maybe we're here today and it's been long enough and the weather will cooperate, but that's always di dicey. So first of all, everything that we sort of know about this, and I'm going to assume people know nothing about it because I think that's fair, is as with all drug reactions, the names are terrible. Even if they sound good, they're probably wrong. So let's start with this. Stevens-Johnson, toxic epidermal necrolysis, sometimes called TENS. And plastic surgeons who look after these patients in burn unit call it TENS. And that stands for toxic epidermal lysis, toxic epidermal necrolysis syndrome, which is not a bad name at all, actually. But that's not what dermatologists usually call it. And the title here is probably longer than my talk. But I'm just going to cover a lot of things fairly superficially. And you can make skin remarks about that. But superficially, because I think other people will get into the details. And you've already received some reading material. So in terms of conflicts, I've worked with various companies over the years who had trouble with drugs. I don't think there's anything here that is going to be screamingly a conflict. And if there is, I'll be happy to point it out. But I think we'll be covering it at too great a distance, and I can't imagine what there would be. And therapeutic comments for Stevens-Johnson TN, which is part of my remit, there are no approved drugs for treating drug reactions, really. There might be antidotes for overdoses. But in terms of treating hypersensitivity reactions, you sort of imagine what company is going to say, we've got this new drug in the pipeline, and it's there to treat drug reactions. I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's going to do really well with the shareholders. but. So one of the terms that we use is SCAR for severe cutaneous adverse reactions. And there are ones called DRESS, which is a syndrome that involves internal organs and the skin and fever and people are sick. There's AGEP where people get blisters with pustules, pus coming out of the skin, red and scaly, again, very sick and with fever. Fever tends to be a hallmark of the systemic reactions. A lot of people just get a rash with a drug, but sometimes a rash is just a rash. And it's not a big deal, and it goes away. Doesn't necessarily mean, as I had taught, been taught years ago, that it might turn into something scary later. It doesn't. But fever is a scary finding. And Stevens-Johnson or TENS, we do see fever with that. These people are sick, and they have internal organ involvement sometimes, and they have a very high death rate, maybe 30 40%, even with the best management. So you've got a 30% death rate from this drug reaction. You've got a 100% horrible suffering rate from this reaction. And the reason you would even allow it to happen is that the drugs we have there, we tend to need. If it shows up, and I've seen unbelievably amazing medications disappear just as they were about to come to market because there were too many of these. And these were drugs that would have changed, literally would have changed the health landscape, and nothing has come to replace them. And yet, if we could have screened those drugs properly, they could be on the market today. And that would have saved a lot of people a lot of misery and lives. So Stevens-Johnson. It's a favorite term. We'll often hear people call us from the emergency department of dermatology to say, we have a patient with Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And, and usually that's their way of getting us to the emergency department. It's usually not true. 
<laughs> so, but anything is Stevens Johnson syndrome to them. And it's so easy to make that mistake if you don't see it. These are sick people. And I usually just ask, how did the person get to the emergency department? They say, I don't know. And they, they come back, they say they took the bus. They say, well, then they don't have Stevens Johnson syndrome. So that's my thing. So, what about Stevens and Johnson? In 92, Stevens and Johnson described what was sort of a variation of what had been called erythema multiforme before in the late 1800s. And it was a bit different. They just had this mucositis with mouth sores and spots on their skin. Two kids, black and white pictures in the journal. It's not what we're talking about. And toxic epidermal necrolysis in a wonderful paper by Alvin Lyles, British derma a, a, a Scottish dermatologist, uh, who uh, really described a whole bunch of diseases that had this feature pathologically and clinically. But they weren't all what we call toxic epidermal necrolysis now. In fact, much of the literature on toxic epidermal necrolysis includes staph scalded skin syndrome and probably other diseases too. And it's really been a bit of a mess. And yet, in many parts of the world, this is called Lyle syndrome. So Stevens-Johnson syndrome and Lyle syndrome, they're not what we're talking about. So again, we have bad names. We need to probably rename these, which is another good reason for a meeting. But these are bad names. So what do we have? We have a spectrum of a lot of different things going on. In the upper left, we have erythema multiforme. Now, for non-dermatologists and physicians, erythema means red, multiforme means it could look like anything. So basically, anything could be erythema multiforme, but that's not true. Erythema multiforme describes a fairly benign disease that's usually post-viral. And people have these three ring targets. Sadly, Target is leaving Canada, but I liked seeing their bags because they had those three ring <laughs> targets on their bags, and it always warmed my heart to see that. But the problem also is not just in the naming here, but the pathology, the lymphocytic infiltrate that you get, the interface dermatitis, a pathologist will call that erythema multiforme. But it doesn't mean the disease the person has is erythema multiforme. It just means that they have that. We see that in that dress disease. We see that with Stevens-Johnson TN or TENS when we look at the edge of lesions. So that's a bit confusing. When the SCAR group got together in Europe, over 400 million population were surveyed for the severe reaction that really fits this. And this group is Stevens-Johnson to TN. And Stevens-Johnson here was the mild end of a very severe disease. It was not trivial. And what you see is that patient there has this hemorrhagic mucositis in their mouth with crusting and blood in there. It's in their nose, in their eyes, may well be on their genitals. And they don't have a three ring target. They have a little two, two hued target. It's a little bit dark red in the middle, lighter red on the edge. We call them atypical targets. The naming of this was actually controversial, but it had to go through many languages and come out making sense. So atypical targets was the bottom line. And then it starts to coalesce and blister, and these blisters get worse and worse. Now, depending when you see that patient, they might meet a different spectrum there. But just like staging with cancer, that's sort of who they become, is that's their stage, that's the prediction of what their outcome might be. The further along you are, the more likely you are to have uh, morbidity. Uh, mortality as an outcome. So I'll, I'll tell you a quick story for a, a clinical thing that we saw just late last year. Got a call, a woman has Stevens-Johnson syndrome in the emergency, indeed she did. And they said it was caused by amoxyl. She had a sore throat, she took amoxyl. So a resident goes down and they know that they have to get a better history because they know I'm going to ask. And the fact was that she had taken Tegretol carbamazepine three weeks earlier. Given to her for a headache in a walk-in clinic, which makes no sense, okay? Which is often the case for these things. Now, does she have Stevens-Johnson syndrome? Yes, she did. What caused it? The carbamazepine is far more likely. It was a sore throat from that Stevens-Johnson syndrome that she got the amoxyl for. But it'd be so easy to make the mistake there and say it was this drug and never know it was the other one. Could be a huge mistake. So this is her and She's in the hospital. She didn't go to the intensive care unit. She didn't have that much blistering, but she was in hospital for about four weeks. She was quite sick. She had to be fed with a nasogastric tube because of the severe sloughing that she had in her nasal cavity and her oropharynx. All that from that Tegretol pill, and that's bigger than it really is, but she took carbamazepine, doesn't have to be Tegretol, and this is what she ended up with. And she's Indian. And because she was from South Asia, we asked her, did you have a genetic test done? She should have. She did not. 
So we did it. And why do I say she should have had it done? Because in 2009, the FDA said that there are genetically at-risk populations. We'll hear a lot about that today. They should be screened. Should doesn't sound very powerful. Should isn't must be screened. Should you know, strongly be considered for screening. But still, it was there. And I'll tell you the impact of this. If you look at, if you Google Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and many of you may have done that before this meeting, you would have probably had to go through the first eight pages of lawyers to get to anything actually medically close to Stevens-Johnson syndrome because it's big business for lawyers. And they all have expertise in this, and they'll get you a big settlement. Shouldn't be there. We shouldn't be there. This person never should have got the drug, perhaps, and we should be able to protect people, much in the way as we've seen that can be done in a country where you theoretically can't do that. So she was B star 1502 positive. And so what well, does that matter? Because we already know she had the reaction. Well, it does because now the amoxyl looks even less interesting to us. Nobody can convince me the amoxyl did it. And believe me, people are always trying. Three weeks? How could it have caused it? Well, if you believe the tipping point idea, that's sort of it, too. If you keep piling sand in a pile, there's a point where you eventually get an avalanche of sand. And there's something that happens here that makes that happen as well. So the HLA test was very supportive of the diagnosis and the etiology and would be very good for genetic counseling in the family. Now, most people in that family, if she was your sister, you probably would not want to take that drug. What looks hypothetical and rare is clearly not so hypothetical and rare. So, Okay. Her family history, which I thought I had next, is, is actually quite interesting because her brother had been taking Tegretol for years without any problems, three years. And we, we finally got him to come in and have his testing done. And he, too, was 1502 positive. So it doesn't mean that everybody who has that gene is going to get the reaction. It's an important concept in several areas. One. We're talking about genomics and screening populations, but we're also talking about genetics and individual risk. And while it's not 100%, it's the best marker we have of risk. And it might not be the only marker, but it could be the best right now. And we know that if we screen, and Wen Hung Chung and his group have done that, if you screen, you can prevent this disease. But there are people there who could have taken Tegretol and not had a problem. But if you really, really needed carbamazepine, or allopurinol, another drug that could do this with a different gene. If you really, really needed it, then you wouldn't just have what is currently in the product monograph that says there is a risk, you might have a risk. You'd say you really do have a risk. And we know the best way to treat this drug is to stop it early. So if we see this reaction and we want to stop the drug early, we have an impact. There's a lot of things that come from knowing that. Now, this is something that I've been building up over the years. There's many components that go into this, and I'll get into it. But you'll be hearing a lot during this meeting about the mechanisms from people far more knowledgeable than I. And you'll be seeing pictures about how T cells and keratinocytes, when I started in dermatology a long time ago, keratinocytes, there's a whiff, perhaps, that keratinocytes did something than just be there. And they do a lot. And they're not the only cells in the skin who are doing a lot. And then you've got your, you know, you've got dendritic cells and you've got lymphocytes and cytokines, and it's a much more exciting story now about what's going on. But the bottom line is that the genetic testing still has great, great relevance, and I hope I showed that. Now, James Reason and a colleague came up with what was ultimately called the Swiss cheese model. Um, and I remember speaking in Switzerland, I asked them, I said, what do you call Swiss cheese? And they said, cheese. <laughs> I thought, OK, it's good to know. So in this cheese model, if you're from Switzerland, the idea is that whether it's airplane safety or anything, that you really need a lot of things to line up to make it a problem. We have built-in safety systems. We are here because we beat the odds in so many ways. And drugs make it to the market by a survival of the fittest. They also make it to market after being screened extensively and then being used in clinical practice extensively. And the bad ones generally get gone because they, don't cause, they do cause too many reactions. So for the people who have this, a lot of things have to line up to make it happen. So if we pretend that we're going to look at what's going on in a patient, here you have this wonderful story, which is what attracted, to me, attracted me to this area in the first place. You sort of know what caused it in, term, in terms of the trigger. And you know what the outcome is. And now we have better definitions. And you've got the drug. 
and then you'd know the structure of that drug and maybe the metabolites of that drug. And this is where cytochrome P450s come in. And so you're getting not only that parent drug, but metabolites. Or you might be getting more of the drug because the metabolism is, is blocked and it's not as active as it should be. And then it interacts with the immune system through the HLA, but maybe through other components. So you've got the structure, you've got the metabolism, and we know about these cytochrome P450 or CYP genes. We know about the human leukocyte antigen or HLA genes. And at the end, we get the full expression of the immune toxicity. You might have problems in several of those areas. And at the very end, if your immune system doesn't want to listen to it, it doesn't listen to it. So we don't know all that, but we do know that there are many steps that go on, and we can actually measure those. So this is about her brother. So her brother, guess what? So he indeed was HLA B star 1502 positive. So it's not everything, okay? So that's where this multi-step process comes in. And that's why we're interested in the CYP genes as well as the HLA genes, among others. Now the epidemiology. We, we, in, if you signed up for the meeting, you would have received a paper in epidemiology that we did with uh, Ronnie Dodiagad, who's from Israel, uh, Phil Laws, who's in Leeds now in the UK, and myself. And you know what, the bottom line is, to make it very simple, that it's a rare disease, if you will, on purpose. It's a rare disease because we get rid of drugs that cause it a lot. However, there are areas and populations, nivirapine in um, Malawi, you know, drugs are being used there to treat AIDS, you get a lot of toxic epidermal necrolysis, more than you might tolerate in other situations. I, I don't want to make too much political statement there, but it's an issue. But it's rare. But we do know that there are risks in certain populations with certain genes and certain drugs. And so we know we need to pay attention to those. I mentioned carbamazepine because it's probably one of the best worked out models. I don't think it's the most dangerous drug there is. That's not why we're talking about it. But it's the best worked out model. And allopurinol is also a similarly dangerous drug for these kinds of reactions. But the warnings are not quite as clear and there are so many warnings for patients, for physicians, product monographs, labels, that are sort of not right there until you actually get the disease and look it up and you go, oh, that's what they were talking about. And we have genes for that. And I see we just had a person in our burn unit who had that, a woman who was admitted with dress who has it as well. Now here's the genomics. You've got this paper. There's a lot of drugs and a lot of genes that we know, all with different relevance and different strength. Diagnosis of this disease. Well, these are sick people. I showed you a picture before. I won't dwell on it. But this is painful. And people are in a coma usually when we're treating them. We keep them in a coma for a long time. But I have to tell you that when they come in as patients later, they've suffered horribly, and they don't want to see these pictures. You have to hide them. I don't show them to the residents and say, oh, this is what this person looked like in hospital. It's terrifying for them. So how do you make a diagnosis? You need lots of things. And I was in a meeting. Somebody called the Shears Diagnostic Triangle, which I liked. But I'd like all of these. I'd like to know, is it a blistering disease? Does it have those spots? Is it systemic with fever, maybe respiratory, another involvement? What about the histology? Do we see the epidermal necrosis or apoptosis or whatever we're seeing in the epidermis? Do we see that? And then when you want to stage it and define where it is, you can go back to this thing that we made up many years ago as part of the early scar years in Europe to say that these are the features that define what stage you're at. Causality? Causality assessment is something that clinicians do very, very poorly. And this is from uh, XKCD, uh, NASA engineers, uh, uh, Russell Monroe, who does this. I used to think correlation applied causation. Then I took a statistics class. Now I don't. Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. <laughs> correlation does not equal causality. And causality assessment is very much enhanced by testing. But it's a shame to have to do the testing after the fact. So the treatment is hugely variable. We did a survey, our group, uh, with Ronnie Doty again. We surveyed all the Canadian US burn units, had about a 35% response rate. And results were all over the map in many different areas. We, we looked at how people treated it. If you want to summarize what the standards today may well be, they might be high-dose corticosteroids, cyclosporin, and even anti-TNF therapy. Intravenous immune globulin, which is expensive and is, was touted early on, may not be that effective does have risks of hemolysis and clotting, et cetera. So it's sort of fallen away. But for legal reasons, people will still use it because you don't want to be sued that you didn't treat the person fully. For the eyes, 
Maybe cyclosporin eye drops will turn out to be useful, but for now, I think the gold standard are amniotic membranes, and they need to be paid attention to. To survive this and be blind for the rest of your life is not exactly a happy ending. The genitals, we see women who come in with genital scarring that could be permanent. Children, boys and girls, don't have their genitals examined necessarily carefully, end up with permanent scarring. Again, something that needs to have attention. And post-traumatic syndromes have been well reported, and we're studying it now as well. But I'll tell you, the outcome is not that people are afraid to take drugs. They know doctors give them drugs, so they're afraid to see doctors. And they will just not go to see the doctor. And their stories are highly impactful. They're powerful stories. So we can do better. We know that patients should be screened, but they're not being screened. We see that over and over and over again, and it's, it's disconcerting. Better communication has to come from all the advances in science that we're having to get perhaps better regulatory and other influential effects to talk about this, to get patients to understand it, to get doctors to understand how to communicate all this so it doesn't become too skewed one way or the other. And patient support groups are pretty good at staying involved and being in touch. But what we want to do is get doctors to be, have, to be in the mode to be able to do this. But maybe it does need to be systematic, systematic and systemic across a healthcare system. Care guidelines are needed, and we have a meeting coming up where we're going to discuss that. I, I just put this slide together as a bit of a model, and I, I hope Terry's comfortable with it. It's about partnering for success. You can have models that are purely funded on a public end, or it could be say with NIH, or purely on a private end with industry. And FDA would have influence, perhaps, at the industry, say, at least to make things happen. And there could be research applications that go to the university that are studying the science, the safety, and the efficacy of these drugs, and coming up with actual clear structures and models to make it happen. So I'm going to conclude with this slide. And to Terry's shock and surprise, I'm actually on time. <laughs> on Tuesday, June 8th, before the World Congress of Dermatology, we have a meeting of the International Severe Cutaneous Adverse Reaction Group. Wen Hung Chung and I are co-chairing that. And it's going to be dermatology heavy because it's a dermatology meeting. But we have speakers, many of you here may be, will probably be speaking there, um, on severe cutaneous reactions with much of the emphasis on Stevens Johnson TN. And we'll be polling as well for people's attitudes to therapy and treatment. So I'll just leave that up there in case anybody wants information about it. This is the link that will give you the program and information about how to register for that meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shear. We have plenty of time for uh, questions, please. Uh, yes. So Neil, I enjoy that review. Some would uh, disagree with not including IVIG in your treatment list. But um, I, I actually agree with your assessment. But it, what I wanted you to do is uh, address the histopathology. Because in Stevens-Johnson, some people call this all a spectrum. But there's a noted differential in terms of the histology with inflammatory cells at one end with virtually no inflammatory cells at the other end. How does one evolve? into the other, or are they really two different entities? I know they're, now they're always lumped, everybody lumps them, but has anybody looked to, to really see what, what that is? Yeah, so it's a very good question about the spectrum and the immunologic response. I think, Wenhong, you're going to be talking about some of that? Yeah, so we'll, we'll hear more about the granulison story and, and others about the... Talk about the histology. So the histology... So when we have, on that slide with the spectrum of disease, if you just look at the skin and you see this infiltrative lymphocytes, then you want to know are they CD4 positive, CD8 positive, might look for other markers uh, fully to understand those. So now we can differentiate those, so that's sort of helpful. And you're looking more at the CD8 ones that are going to lead to blistering. And then you're looking at the cytokines that come from there. But I think if one wanted to look at a nice model of it, when you get into the far right where we had people with this diffuse blistering without all the spots and stuff, some have called pure plaque. There have been other names for it. But it's this kind of thing. There's a large differential there. But one of the generalized bullets is fixed drug eruption. And in fixed drug eruption, uh, 
we, we've always wondered why it's specifically in that area and not the area next to it and how the patch testing will be positive in one area but not right next to it. And Tetsuo Shihara in Tokyo has done a very nice job of, of looking at the stages there. And one sees the stages you go through. There are memory cells there um, that will start a whole cytokine storm. And then they're not really that necessary after that, but they call in the cytokines, call in CD8 positive cells, and then you get more going on, and then those cells sort of disappear. Does that answer the question about that whole spectrum? No. But it does show that there are all these stages that are going on. And it's a story that's hard to recreate. We don't really have good animal models. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area. So you have mentioned the metabolizing of the drug. And my understanding is that the metabolites contribute to anti antigenicity, OK? And that may uh, trigger CTLs, et cetera. But what else about the metabolite? I mean, there's a whole theory outside the immunology aspect of this disease, right? Yeah, so I mean, our early work was all in the pharmacology side, the reactive metabolite story and whatever. And I still think that's very relevant. But it isn't the only story. And so you might have people who are creating more of what would be a reactive metabolite that might be more toxic. Um, however, you might also have people who have decreased metabolism of uh, the parent drug, and the parent drug is the problem. So for allopurinol, for example, uh, almost all those patients have renal insufficiency, uh, higher levels of allopurinol, hydroxyallopurinol. And when you patch test, for example, we did a ton of those in a group in uh, Portugal did a lot too. And we did it with the drug, with the metabolite. No one's ever patch test positive. What's going on with allopurinol, I don't think we really understand. But the idea is that the entire molecule might react with the HLA system or other ways of triggering the immune system. So there's a lot to do. But I think you're right. The idea that there are there is pharmacologic components, immunological components. And depending on the puzzle and other genetic and epigenetic aspects might lead to what the actual disease is that you see. So even though we know the cause, here's a drug and here's the outcome, the outcomes might look similar, but the story in between might be very different for individuals. Um, yes. Uh, what is the uh, cost of conducting the test? That, what test do you use? And then how quickly do you get the results back? I can only speak for our site. Um, it could be different all over the place. But we did look into that when they said, why are you ordering so many of these genetic tests? You're ordering too many. And I said, well, everybody else should be ordering them. We're ordering them because nobody else did. And they said, OK, fine. For us, in, it would probably be in US dollars, about 200 US dollars to have the test done. Um, it would be nice if that came down. But I mean, honestly, if you, if you showed somebody a picture of toxic epidermal necrolysis and you said it'll cost you $200 to find out if you're going to be at risk for that, um, I think most people would pay it, but then they wouldn't take the drug anyways because you just show them a picture of toxic epidermal necrolysis, and they say, no, never mind. I mean, we, we, you know, if it was food, you wouldn't eat it. I mean, it's just, you, know, you just don't go near there. So, and, and so I think it's, it's on balance, though, one would have to do a real economic analysis to see to the healthcare system, especially if you're using IVIG. And as Dr. Katz said, it doesn't necessarily support it either, but on the other hand, it is used a lot but it's a very expensive therapy, even for a short time. Um, and then if you need repeat dosing, it can be quite expensive. So, uh, and then it's a, a disease with high mortality and huge mor morbidity. So I, I don't know what it's worth. I don't know what it's worth. And, and how quickly do you get the result back? Some people will get the results uh, in a day or so. So we had a patient we were called about at one of the teaching hospitals, major teaching hospital. I was emailed by one of the internists who said, I have a patient who had a reaction to phenytoin. We want to give him carbamazepine. And the residents all told me, that they should have genetic testing done. Is that true? And I said, I'm surprised the residents actually knew that, but that's right. And she said, how do I order it? I said, well, how do you order a complete blood count? You write down CBC, and you write down HLA B star 1502, and you get it done. And they had it within a day, and he was positive. So they're very happy not to have given him the drug. So it can be done very quickly if you need. So why, why this? diseases attack the barrier tissues. Why this skin and mucosa? Is there a simple explanation for this, or it's much more complex? Well, there are a lot of cells that will have markers that show that they do hone into the skin. And, um, but it's still a good question for a lot of these reactions. Many of them, for instance, are in areas that have been sun exposed. And we know about reactions to many drugs, including chemotherapy, where it will attack 
previously sun exposed or burned areas. Others are pressure exposed. We, we don't know why completely, but I think there's a lot going on there in terms of what the skin cells want to do. However, um, depends on a crossover with dress. Some of these people will get liver involvement. Some people will have a kidney or other blood involvement, but not as much as the other systemic syndromes. And um, I don't know if that's going to be discussed today about the skin homing or a bit. Yeah? Yeah, probably a bit. We'll hear a bit more about that. The point is that it is skin and other stratified squamous epithelia. It's not all epithelia. So we have many precedents for that. The best precedent probably is uh, in the area of pemphigus, for example. We know what the antigens are, and it may be that that secondary um, need for the disease, in addition to the HLA, is something else that has specificity for stratified squamous epithelia. Because you go down the esophagus, you get to a point where there's no longer stratified squamous epithelia, and you don't see the lesion. You do see the lesion in the general mucosa, which up to a point where there's stratified squamous epithelia. So th that must be a clue. I don't know the answer, but it must be a clue. Now, and like the lady there, she had esophageal involvement. Uh, many patients will have bladder involvement, like in pemphigus too. People get bladder involvement. Um, but uh, I think in, in the beginning with a big disease like this, I, I feel like we're the uh, investigators for a fire department. You know, when you're seeing this whole house on fire, you don't get down to the, the nuances of where the fire started and what other damage has been done and what's missing. And so when this disease comes in, they're, they're often very bad, especially at a referral center where we get them after they've been played around with at other centers. So yeah, it could come up later because we haven't looked for it. Um, but it's not as well staged as dress where you sort of see a lot of atypical lymphocytes and then you see a lot of eosinophils and it's got a different staging. Um, actually, we'll talk more about that at the ISCAR meeting. But um, it, it may well be happening early on, but I don't have the same sense of exactly when. You don't necessarily look at them in such great detail. So, uh, excellent talk, Neil, as usual. From a liver point of view, I always understand why drugs harm the liver. That's where they're metabolized. But the skin, a bit of a mystery, isn't it? Are, are these drugs concentrated in the skin? Are they metabolized in... Uh, no, it's a very good question, Jay. I mean, we wondered about that from the very beginning. We tried to metabolize some drugs with skin cells in culture. Right. And I started off with acetaminophen, which is a good example, thinking of the liver, that you know we could do with hepatocytes in culture. In those days, it was still early days about culturing them. It wasn't that long post-green. And so, but and we could see, we did HPLC, and we could actually see some metabolites. But I think the metabolic contribution is probably pretty small. It's not like the liver, and it would have probably passed through the liver before it ever got to the skin anyways. Um, so I, I, I don't know that the pharmacology in the skin is going to be quite as critical as the immunology in the skin. That's just my quick summary. We may hear different today. The other thing is we always think of a gene as the bad thing. You know, this is the bad thing. But it, it may be the wild type, and... There's something that protects the other people. Yeah, so a good example. So when you find funny reactions to a drug, sometimes it's the wild type uh, rather than yeah, so in it's less than HLA. But. An example for that to me is with sulfonamides, where acetylation might be important. And slow acetylators may be at higher risk of some of these reactions. But I often look at it the other way, saying fast acetylators are protected. <clears throat> you might have a funny 2C19 but you might be protected because you're a fast acetylator. So sometimes, you know, the genes protecting people and sometimes genes are, are hurting people. And then it's the balance. That's why I like the Swiss cheese model. So, Neil, I was, I was wondering, you, you commented a couple of times that the, the nomenclature is difficult and, and the diagnosis even can be, can be difficult. And, and I, I think we've seen that in other fields. And sometimes the answer has been what's been referred to as molecular taxonomy. So, so if you can define a disease molecularly, either on a genetic basis or, or otherwise, uh, sometimes things fall into place. And, you know, breast cancer is a good example of that, probably Charcot-Marie Tooth that has all these different types. Do you, do you think there's a, you know, now an avenue for molecular definition, not just in Genetics, but the, the, the genetics and the immunology and, and that, and is that a direction we should try to pursue? I think it's a direction you should try and pursue. I don't know exactly what that um, 
you know, menu is going to look like with how many different genes uh, and how many different, you know, it was interesting years ago, I remember with epidermolysis bullosa, I was speaking to uh, the genetics group at Sick Children's, and they said, well, you don't think that could ultimately be a single gene causing those. I said, well, why not? Well, it's so complicated. They said, well, zinc deficiency is just from zinc. I mean, it looks complicated too. But somehow with this, I think it's just sort of, with drug reactions, it's different because they're weeded out. You know, we, we, it could be, we'd obviously have a lot more information if we kept on drugs that were killing lots of people. Uh, but we don't have that with Charcot Marie Tooth and with other ones, you know. And the family history is then perturbed because this woman's children will never take the drug and her siblings won't take the drug. So you end up with all kinds of challenges, I think, to get the kind of specificity that you might like for that. But it's certainly worth knowing more. And if we can tailor drugs to, you know, be based on that, it would be great. Um, and I think the cards that we would have ultimately in the future will be a lot more complicated than just your HLA. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry, may I have another question? Yes, you mentioned that in drug development, there were companies that just in very late stage drug development stopped because of uh, SJSTN. Um, did those trials collect DNA samples? And because the odds ratios on these reactions are so high, they may even be able to find what is the uh, um, you know, associative uh, allele. Any thoughts on those lines? Oh, yeah. I, I think about that all the time. Um, we actually were collecting cells in patients we were studying as part of that reaction because I thought we might be able to do genetics one day. But this was before people would get consent to do genetic studies. And the samples, oh, they could still be in a minus 80 freezer somewhere. What isn't? But uh, no, and then people are long gone. So I don't know what happened. It was a long time ago. But uh, the, the drug I'm speaking of is Sorbonyl, which was an all-dose reductase inhibitor, and had huge impact of preventing diabetic-related sorbit sorbitol-caused um, neuropathy, especially neuropathy and uh, retinopathy and nephropathy. And there were many drugs coming out that were also going to be all those reductase inhibitors. And it looked like there'd be a future that might be better with other drugs. But I don't think it's happened yet. And uh, patients who were on this drug, they're the only people I've seen who had Stevens-Johnson syndrome, who said, is there any way you can get me back on that drug? My pain disappeared within days. Could you get me back on that drug? So it's a big loss. But, and now you think you could screen for that. If you, if you had the samples, but then you'd have to have people to have the reaction to prove it. Though structurally, it's very similar to phenotone. And we'll cross-react in vitro with people's cells. Uh, that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine with uh, phenotone. Neil, has there ever been a drug that has been identified before it's gone on the market that, and has been eliminated because of TEN? I mean, it's such a rare event. Yeah, there, yeah drugs. There's, I mean, often if you do a phase one study, if there's 10, 20 people and four people get a rash, that's often the end of a drug. You don't know if they're going to uh, I'm talking about TEN, though. So this drug, this drug was TEN. Sorbonyl was about to be approved. Uh, and phase three data, Vera Brill's group published the neuropathy data with sural nerve biopsies and everything in the New England Journal. And then there were a couple of cases from some of the studies, and that was the end of it. So never made it to market. When you show the uh, case report, you report the, within the family, the lady has the same gene with uh, her brother. The, the lady had the same Johnson syndrome, but, but brother does not. Do you have any data show that people carry the same gene without this drug gene interaction? Uh, Wen Hung, we'll, we'll talk to that, but I think the idea is yes. I mean, we know that for every one of these tests, there's a number needed to treat and to test. And you're going to have a lot of people who have a gene who aren't going to have the reaction. On the other hand, if they do have the gene, you can have a very thoughtful approach to the therapy or conversation. Um, and I think that just, for us, highlighted that it was, uh, you know, not was the answer for that woman. But obviously, there were differences. There were differences between the two of them in terms of why one of them had a reaction or not. And the HLA was a great screening tool that could have been used, but it wasn't the only answer.
Okay, thank you very much. So, oh, there's one. More question, I think. Oh, one. <laughs> the trouble is, if you answer a question, then you might stimulate another question. I just don't answer. If somebody has had a previous reaction, like a simple rash, to a drug, does that predict something more serious? Well, it's a very fundamental clinical question. I'll just repeat it so everybody's heard it. If somebody took a drug and had a simple rash, and then they took the drug again later, are they going to be at higher risk of having Stevens-Johnson TN? I, I will say no, but with a caveat. And the caveat is, I can pull up cases that sound like that, and maybe they, they do happen. There was a woman who we saw, for instance, who had a history of allergy to amino penicillin, to ampicillin. And she saw a dentist, and a dentist gave, we use cloxacillin, not diclox or fluclox in Canada, it was given cloxacillin. And she had toxic epidermal necrolysis from cloxacillin. And we patch tested her later to both, and she was positive to both. Would I have said that if you had a reaction to an amino penicillin and a rash, which 8% of people do, that you're at risk of getting a reaction to cloxacillin? No. But the dentist was sued. I don't know what happened. It's just sort of nice to see, not just doctors getting sued. But, um, uh, but I, you know, it was, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, they asked, they got an answer, and you probably wouldn't have given her that drug, which makes it hard to know. People will say, oh, you had a rash from such and such. I'm not going to give you that, ideally. I, I teach our medical students about a sulfonamide reaction where the doctor said, are you allergic to any drugs? She said, I'm allergic to sulfonamides. He said, oh, what happened? She says, I don't know. It was like 30 years ago. And he said, oh, so it'll be fine. And she ended up in the burn unit with toxic epidermal necrolysis. Well, I think the teaching there is without genetics, if the person tells you they had a rash, you sort of look for alternatives unless you really need to use it. So it's going to be hard to collect that data. OK, so now we have to move on. We have uh, 30 minutes for discussion at the end of the two uh, keynotes. Um, so next speaker is Dr. Wen Hang Chang, Director of Drug Impersensivity Clinical Research Center, Department of Dermatology, Chang'an Memorial Hospital, and Associate Professor of Chang'an University of Taiwan. And the title is? You can see basic science of pathogenesis, functional genomics, and mechanisms. So 20, 25-minute talks, and we, we can have five to 10 minutes discussion.